And on today's show, how deferred compensation can generate sales opportunities for new plans. Part four of this week's series on deferred compensation with Regional Vice President of Business Owner and Executive Solutions, Sherry Flint. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Background Technician in Innsmark. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to day four. How are you handling? Thanks day for four having me back. I'm doing savant. good. You know, you're just, you're going through this and we're talking about deferred comp. We're trying to talk about something I haven't heard much about. And I'm, I went through my archives. I just saw no, and I've done over 1200 shows. I have not seen one show on deferred comp. Well, so I'm... you're bringing it back to the, to the video side of our equation. And I, when I'm talking about it, I'm looking for Today we want to talk about plan sponsorship considerations, but the bigger part of that equation is what are the expectations? What can I expect out of this? And I think that a lot of people are sitting there saying, well, you know, we talked about yesterday, well, we're in the market. Could a person be more conservative than being in the market? Because both the products we talked about yesterday are actually market-driven securities. So what, what could we be talking today about? Is, is there anything more conservative than that? Is there considerations? Is there expectations? I want to walk through some of those things today. Okay, so from a plan design standpoint, the employer is going to look at, you know, do I want to offer a mm -hmm. menu of investment choices or maybe do I just want to offer a fixed rate of return? And that is completely up to the plan sponsor. So anything they anything want to do. Anything they oh. want. And they can credit the participant accounts any way they want. Oftentimes we'll see um, for the participant's own deferral compensation, a menu of investment choices. And the advisors that I work with typically will give them a broad selection, just like you would on a 401k plan. So if I'm conservative, I can create my own conservative portfolio, or if I'm more aggressive or I have a longer time horizon, I can have something mm -hmm. more uh, aggressive. But oftentimes on the employer contribution, sometimes they tie it to company stock. Mm. Sometimes they have a fixed rate of return. It really just depends on what the employer is trying to accomplish. Well, is this is that popular after Enron? I mean, you know, tying it to the company you stock. You know, it, it depends on the company. But that's mm -hmm. why we typically only see it on the employer contribution side mm -hmm. versus, you know, putting the employee money at risk. If I'm looking at, there's a, there's a sales cycle to this. Mm -hmm. Walk me through the, I walked in the door. I found out through the discovery process mm -hmm. where I need to go, the solution, because everything has a fit to it. Right. Walk me through after that, though. I would say the sales cycle for deferred compensation plans is anywhere from six months to a year and a half. Now, depending on the company, the larger the company, the more, um, the longer the decision-making cycle, right? Because you have more stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So, for example, let's say you're working with a company with 150 employees. You're going to have a CEO as part of the plan design. You're going to have a CFO making the financing decisions as part of plan design. You're going to have the HR team saying, you know what, I don't want any more work on my plate. How are you going to make this really simple and easy? So you have a number of different stakeholders that you have to address. Mm -hmm. But I would say the thing that plan sponsors are looking for in today's world is they want a plan that oftentimes looks and feels like a 401k plan, an additional benefit for their key mm -hmm. employees, but they need it to be simple and they need it to be easy and they need it to be turnkey. Well, Nobody can, wants more work. Can that all be accomplished? It can be. Uh, the trend is definitely towards more simpler plan designs, mm -hmm. flexibility, investment choices, but simpler plan design. When I'm looking at the, the basic, it, uh, my, as an advisor, I have a role to play. I need to know what is the necessities. I, we, I might be scared a bit because you said some of this might take about 18 months. Mm -hmm. And people say, hey, I need to have a living here. Before, you know, before, I can't wait 18 months. But if I'm looking at smaller companies, and I want to try to just go down this road for a second. So if I'm under 100, mm -hmm. the decision-making process is probably be a little quicker, Much not quicker. that many people involved. Mm -hmm. And I, you told me in the it's yesterday segment, hey, the, the tax bracket could be as low as 15% and it may work. Mm -hmm. So now I'm all of a sudden excited. Maybe I ought to go down a little lower cut my teeth on a smaller company, mm -hmm. keep the cash flow coming in as an advisor, and then maybe move up to the bigger leagues as I have this already in the mill, you know, it's already in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about, when you're targeting, I'm, strictly as an advisor audience, I mean, we're talking to advisors here, I'm wondering what are the best practices, what's their role in the best practices when we're talking about deferred comp? So I would say I break the market into two segments, the smaller closely held business market. I define that as companies with 100 or less employees. Mm -hmm. In that space, I like our traditional CERT plans, and in that case, it's going to be like we used to do 10 or 15 years ago. Steve, you're my key employee. I take out an insurance policy on you. I fund it every year. And when I vest, I transfer the policy for value. Very simple, mm -hmm. easy turnkey. Or I might even look at a very um, a nice uh, 162 executive bonus, an after-tax solution mm -hmm. that gives you tax-free income. In the larger space, the 100 or more employee space, advisors have to think like it's a retirement plan, right? Mm -hmm. I need to do annual plan reviews with a committee or the employer. Mm -hmm. I need to do uh, investment reviews every, even though there's no fiduciary responsibility, I need to run it like I would a qualified plan. I need to do education and enrollment meetings. So the, mm -hmm. um, the importance of that more of a retirement plan uh, attitude is gonna be in the larger case market. Now, because we're kind of trying to look like a 401k, mm -hmm. if I'm hearing you correctly, 
do I have to stay within a certain plan? I, the plan only has these mutual funds or these other uh, investments, or no? It, I can bring to the table what I want to bring to the table? Generally speaking, as an advisor, as an advisor you're going to work with a record keeper. So, for example, principal's a record keeper. So if we picked corporate-owned mutual funds or corporate-owned life insurance as the investment vehicle for the sinking fund, mm -hmm. then normally the advisor is going to pick from that menu of investment choices. It could be anywhere mm -hmm. from 50 to 100 choices. Mm -hmm. They're going to narrow it down to a smaller menu, just like you would a 401k, 10 to 15, mm -hmm. 20 investment choices, and that's what the participant will select from. Have you, have you seen this new, after we came out of the recession, the whole deferred comp is getting this new second look. That's why you're mm -hmm. on. Now, when I'm looking at this from an advisor point of view, I'm thinking to myself, I pretty much know the 401k lookalike scene. If mm -hmm. I have to go into the life insurance as an option, I may not know that world, world so much. What's your percentage of, of smaller companies that are doing the life insurance, like, like the SERP you were describing? I would say in the smaller case market, that percentage is mm -hmm. much higher, right? Because they don't have as many choices. Mm -hmm. So on a plan design, it's more than likely going to be an insurance solution in the smaller case market. I'm going to take out, but my choices are going to be different. So as a participant, I could say, you know what, Steve? You can have an indexed UL, you can have a variable life product, or maybe you have a universal life. So I'm going to pick the type of insurance product to match your time horizon mm -hmm. or risk tolerance. We come back from the break. We're going to talk about sales opportunities with brand new plans. We'll be back in 30 seconds. Back in the day, life insurance professionals were called field underwriters. Then, carriers trained their field force in the basics of life insurance underwriting. Today, the insurance industry doesn't educate the agent population as they once did. But now, you can have the informed risk guide at your fingertips so you can illustrate a reasonable rate class for your life insurance prospects. Just request your copy of the informed risk guide at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. It's free from Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Welcome back to the second segment. Sherry, we're looking at different opportunities for brand new plan. I kind of like to start from ground zero because mm -hmm. I think that's something that I could at least walk into. I don't want to have to figure out existing markets. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Walk me through some of the basic concepts. I'm an advisor. I'm drinking your Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to try this. What do I need to do on a brand new plan? There's a couple different ways that you can identify these opportunities, but number one, I would say the number one reason why we're brought in to talk about deferred compensation is we're working with a plan sponsor mm -hmm. that has a 401k plan and the highly comps are limited in how much they can save. So again, we have that um, disparity between the highly comps and the non-highly comps. So the, the highly comps might be limited in how much they can put in the 401k plan. So oftentimes they're looking for a solution. As an advisor, I'm gonna think through, can I fix their 401k plan? Can I add a match to increase participation? Can I add a um, safe harbor provision? Oftentimes with the larger employees, that's going to be too expensive. So the what if, what else can I do could be a deferred compensation plan. Non-qualified deferred comp can work very well in that space. We also look for companies where they have that group of highly compensated folks, 10 or more mm. making 150000 or maybe five or more making two fifty, where they need to be saving more for retirement. We talked in an earlier segment that the vast majority of individuals making 150000 or more are going to retire at somewhere about a 40% replacement ratio unless they have something else. So we're looking for supplemental retirement. Oftentimes we're working for employees that have, um, they pay some really nice discretionary bonuses, but maybe we don't want to give them all in cash anymore. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to look for ways to kind of handcuff or um, mm -hmm. retain those key employees for a shorter or longer period of time. And then I do want to say that one of the things we look for is there is def reverse, de reverse discrimination in qualified plans. Mm -hmm. The highly comps just can't save the same percentage as the rank and file. So oftentimes we're looking at um, looking for employers that are trying to to level the playing field. Let's make sure that the highly comps can save the same percentage as the non-highly comps. Those are some of the opportunities I look for in the new marketplace. So whether you're the 401k advisor, you're the benefits mm -hmm. advisor, or um, you have a relationship with one of the um, key decision makers, I think they're all great options. As an advisor, how do I position myself with a sp plan sponsor? How do I do that? How do you position yourself with a plan sponsor? I would say um, you bring some great ideas to the table. So for example, if you have one of their other benefit programs, their 401k or maybe their group mm -hmm. benefits, I would say I like, to, I like when advisors have an agenda and they say, you know what, we haven't talked about this. We haven't talked about deferred compensation before. Do you have any you know, key employees mm -hmm. that are limited in how much they can save for retirement? So I actually add it as an agenda item. Um, if you're prospecting from cold, we actually have some great mm -hmm. letters you can send and make follow-up phone calls. Now, if you want any of these letters, uh, really, uh, again, a principal is one of our top, uh, what I would call, great brochures and propagandists, and I think you could really benefit from it. You just write me, Steve, at downtobusiness.tv, and I'll be happy to make sure we forward it to you. 
what are the other tools and resources when we're looking at this? I'm an advisor. I'm mm -hmm. liking what you're saying, but I'm, I'm a little green. I'm going, I'm not only am I wanting to do a new plan, I'm kind of new to this myself. So what kind of tools and resources do I have to pull this off? We have a ton of tools. We have um, information that you can use to open the conversation, just general information. Mm -hmm. We have training videos. Uh, we actually have 12 point of sale specialists lined up across the country that will actually go point of sale with no comp mm -hmm. split to work as your consultant. So, Whoa, let's just walk back that a bit. So you have people that will actually do the plan with you, mm -hmm. if I'm hearing correctly, A to Z, no split on comp. That's exactly okay, right. And, and did I also hear, what kind of videos? I mean, they're pretty accessible out online. We have them all on principal.com. Uh -huh. And of course, we can create a link for anybody that's interested. But training videos and mm -hmm. um, videos that are appropriate for employers. We have them on everything from how to do an enrollment meeting to um, what is a deferred compensation plan. So a whole suite of tools and services. And this is all accessible. All accessible and it's all free of charge. Well, I think this is a way to, to educate our advisors, kind of bring them up to speed. You guys have excellent material, brochures. I love it. Now, I, I haven't seen any of the videos yet. I'd like to see that. When I'm looking at, um, I have my tools now. I got some resources. I, I have a ton of uh, issues that I use on background technician, mm -hmm. as an example. When we're talking about this, we have our ideal candidate. We know who we're going after now. If I'm going to go to one place where you say, Steve, this is the place, the jugular vein issue. Boy, if you're going to bring something up, make sure this is your first thing out of your mouth. What would that be? My first thing, if they're failing their 401k mm -hmm. testing, I bring it up as a solution to their problem. Do they know they're failing it, though? I guess my, my question. Absolutely. Every year, um, the larger clients have to go through the discrimination testing. And in mm -hmm. March, they, they find out if they pass or fail the discrimination testing. Here's what happens. If the highly comps are saving, on average, more than 2% more than the average of the non-highlies, so we add up all the non-highly compensated folks in the company, and we see how much are they putting into the 401k. Let's say, on average, they're putting away 2%. Very common in retail, manufacturing, mm -hmm. construction-type industries. Let's say they're putting away 2%. You, as a highly comp, can only put away 4%. So now you're making over 100000 a year. You put 4% into your 401k. That is just not enough. So not only can you not participate and get the 17.5 in, mm -hmm. you're actually going to get a refund if you put in too much. So every year in the first quarter, I think the testing has to be done by the end of March, companies will know if they pass or fail their test mm -hmm. and if they actually have to give a check back to the highly comps because mm -hmm. they put too much money away. It's a very, very painful discussion. Well, let's go down. Do you have a letter to that effect? If I wanted to send a letter out to, uh, have you failed your 401k discrimination yes, we test? Do. So you have something that just walks you into this. Mm -hmm. And hopefully a video as well. We probably have a video that talks about how to overcome those limitations. Well, to me, this is all huge because I want to open up another market for our advisors to get into. Just, again, expanding your practice is the name of the game. That's all the time we have for today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas on the show, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, or your broker-dealer compliance officer. Missed an episode? Just go out to our site, downtobusiness.ashbrokers.com. Want to email me? Steve at downtobusiness.tv. And remember, you could be wiser as an Ash Brokerage Advisor. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you tomorrow.